this revision, the European Commission is working on the development of a sustainable bioenergy policy, which will impact the forestry and the agriculture biomass, but also the organic waste from municipalities, the organic waste stream from municipal solid waste. This organic waste is means it's the food waste from restaurants, it's the households, from the farmers markets, gardens, the clothing, paper, and any material from organic origin that ends up in the residual waste stream at the municipal level. When this organic waste is mixed up, this is sent for this most of the times to incinerators. So, so far, the situation has been that renewable, the Renewable Energy Directive has allowed waste to energy incinerators to receive financial incentives to burn this waste stream for energy purposes. But the thing is that this has turned into one of the key obstacles for the full implementation of the circular economy and it remains a fundamental contradiction within the climate, energy and waste management policies in the European Union. So facing the development of this policy, we want to explore actually when we see organic waste, is this actually a sustainable source of energy or is this actually a resource, a treasure for sustainability that has been neglected so far and we really need to look at what we could do with it to make the most of it. So some of the questions we want to explore today are precisely should this urban biomass be considered the source of sustainable energy? What are the life cycle implications of burning this organic waste versus recovering this organic waste for our soils? What are the key opportunities at the policy level to ensure this strong alignment across the sectors? And what are the most climate-friendly options? And looking at specifically at organic waste management, is the separate collection of biomass viable? Could it be implemented in big cities? And what operational challenges um, or what operational um, evidence of success of overcoming the challenges there is? So to answer these questions, we are joined today with Enzo Favoino and Carla Rose Ostrander that I thank very much for making the time for sharing your expertise with all of us. So Enzo is the chair of the Scientific Committee for Zero Waste Europe, as well as as a researcher and advisor on waste and biomass management with the School Agraria de Parco de Monza. Um, he's given advice to lots of local authorities on waste management schemes and strategies and he is also the co-founder of the European Campus Network and we've enjoyed his support and his vision, his expertise and, and he's been so helpful for, my net, for our network that um, yeah, I, I'm, really, I'm really happy that he's with us today. So I will give the floor to Enzo now. Um, and please, if you have, if participants have questions, you can use the main chat. Um, at the end of the presentations, um, we will have time for questions, but feel free to share your comments or share your questions throughout the presentations. So, Enzo Fabuino, if you are ready, the floor is yours. I'm ready. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so first off, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to give this contribution and thanks for your nice words when introducing me. Um, yeah, the way you put it uh, in your uh, four words uh, is the proper way. Uh, unfortunately, there are many biases and shortcomings in the renewable energy policy in that it only considers uh, bio waste as a potential source of energy as there are many more beneficial ways uh, by which bio-waste may contribute to strategies for mitigation of climate change. We will be dwelling on those and also we will be providing evidence on uh, viability, practicability of separate collection systems for organics, uh, including the densely populated city centers. And Carla will certainly give more detailed insights into the beneficial implications of using compost back onto soils. Anyway, uh, 
just to start with, uh, uh, we know that the issue of the management of organic waste is at the crossroads of many angles of, them, of the environmental sustainability. First of all, if it is not properly managed, it is the major contributor to greenhouse gases from uh, uh, the management of waste. And according to international statistics, this should be accounting between 4 and 11% of total greenhouse gases that come basically from landfills. This very much depends on uh, the global warming factor we want to attribute methane, because methane in the midterm has got a much higher global warming factor than in the long run. Um, the, this is why basically uh, the uh, bio waste management strategies are often driven by the need to reduce the impact of disposal and so the need to divert bio waste away from landfills. This is, for instance, one of the backbones, one of the cornerstones of the European Landfill Directive. In Europe, uh, it was stipulated that 65% of biodegradable waste has to be diverted in the, in long, in the long run away from landfills. And of course, we want to give it back to feed soils instead of feeding uh, incinerators or uh, dump, uh, landfills after stabilization or something like that. There are also some extended benefits which are not only related to the reduced impacts of waste management. If we manage bio waste properly, we can certainly address climate change, we can certainly fight desertification, we know there are many areas, including the Western world, which are under the threat for desertification. Also, we may enhance biodiversity of soils, their fertility, their resilience against extreme weather conditions, which will, we will have to face increasingly according to the ongoing trends in climate change, and so on and so forth. Uh, let me highlight the fact that the EU soil thematic strategy listed uh, the depletion of organic matter from soils as one of the seven threats for soils. And so this is becoming a basic need to find ways to give organic matter back to soils. Certainly compost is one of the most reasonable ways to give organic matter back to soils. Let's go back uh, for a moment to the angle of waste management. Uh, uh, organics uh, play a key role, both from a quantitative and an operational angle. The quantitative angle is that organic waste still around the world is the biggest part of municipal solid waste. And this is even so more true in uh, the low-income countries. Uh, while working in southeastern Asia or in Africa, sometimes in certain waste management districts, we find as much as 70% and more of municipal solid waste to be made of uh, organics. Uh, but the importance is also operational, uh, because once we are able to capture organic waste uh, by means of curbside schemes, uh, separate collection schemes, we may minimize the, their percentage in residual waste, and this, in turn, makes it possible to reduce the collection rounds for, for residual waste. The double benefit. First of all, we incur cost optimization because we will have less collection rounds for residual waste. But also, the uh, less we collect the residual waste, the more we drive also other materials, such as the dry recyclables, as packaging waste, plastics, paper, metals, glass, towards the separately collected materials to go for recycling and not for disposal. So uh, in many respects, good management of organics is key to good waste management. Uh, this is what is being considered in the zero waste strategies and practices we implement locally. This is a chart that refers to the first municipality that adopted a zero waste practice in Europe, namely Capannori which is a municipality in Tuscany, in central Italy, totaling a population of 45,000 people. And uh, they started with production of uh, collection at the doorstep in 2008. Uh, and this was including the organics, of course. Uh, these uh, uh, increased uh, the total percentage of materials which were diverted away from disposal 
and being sent for recycling and composting, the blue part of the bars. Um, but also, a couple of years later, they were able to introduce pay as throw systems, a rewarding system according to which people don't pay for their waste management as a property tax, but as a proportion of how much residual waste they leave for disposal. And the key aspect in order to be able to do that is to take the organics away, because basically uh, the azithro system uh, is uh, typically based on the number of times you set out your residual waste. So in order to do that effectively, you have to divert your organics away so that you may be able to uh, reduce dramatically the number of times you set out your residual waste. So in the end of the story, uh, what the zero waste communities are aiming for is minimization of residual waste that calls for final disposal. Um, but now let's consider the life cycle angle of diverting organics and giving them back to soils. First of all, we know that organics during their degradation, which occurs naturally, they are emitting carbon dioxide. This is considered to be short-term or biogenic carbon, and therefore this is considered in life cycle analysis as carbon neutral. This has increased the interest in organics as a potential source of energy. Because they say once we burn organics, we get some energy, yeah, we produce some carbon dioxide, but this is carbon neutral. Uh, but we should be considered, we should be considering the other angles of managing the organics once we recover them as soil improvers. First of all, if we turn organic into compost, we may replace the mineral fertilizers, and therefore we may avoid production of greenhouse gases which are related to production and application of mineral fertilizers. Also, once we use compost and uh, put it back onto soils, we may lock up some carbon in the soils. This is called the sequestration effect. And this should be considered because once we have got more carbon in the soils to produce fertility, in the global balance of carbon we will have less carbon in the atmosphere to to cause uh, negative effects such as climate change. Also, uh, by means of, of anaerobic digestion, once we uh, combine it with composting, we may also turn part of the biogenic carbon into a substitute fuel, a renewable fuel, uh, biomethane, and this in turn may replace uh, the fossil fuels this might increase the total benefits of proper management of organic waste. So we may have both a renewable fuel and a soil improver to cause the beneficial effects onto soils. There are some problems with life cycle analysis, what we call the limitations of life cycle models. Because normally uh, what is considered in life cycle analysis related to the management of bio-waste is only uh, the material replacement and so the substitution of mineral fertilizers but not the induced effects. For instance, the soil improvements, improve the workability of soils, in turn uh, translates into less energy required for plugging and tilling our soils. And there will be a huge beneficial effect uh, in uh, the energetic input in the primary sector, in the agricultural sector. But also, uh, the problem is that many beneficial effects of soil improvers are difficult to quantify. Their magnitude is important anyway. Uh, one I mentioned already, which is improved workability. Another one is better water retention. If we have that better water retention, there will be less need for irrigation. And so, lower energetic input to take water from where it is to where it is needed, but also carbon sequestration. It is difficult to quantify, but still an important magnitude, and I will show you why the evidence of that. This might be the quantification of savings due to the replacement of uh, mineral fertilizers. This is quite easy to be accounted for. Uh, 
basically uh, you may prepare, you may uh, uh, consider a, a, a chart in which you have, first of all, the content of nutrients, uh, the unit emissions from the production of mineral fertilizers, and therefore, once you multiply the unit emissions from uh, the production of mineral fertilizers times the content of each single nutrient in compost, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, you may come up quite easily with the avoided emissions in terms of carbon dioxide equivalent. So this is already an important effect in itself, but that notes, uh, that's not the biggest part in the picture of uh, overall benefits of uh, using compost vis-a-vis -vis reduced greenhouse gases. Uh, if you consider this chart, for instance, you may see that the magnitude of uh, savings in terms of uh, greenhouse gases from uh, the replacement of mineral fertilizers is remarkably lower than savings in, uh, coming from uh, anaerobic digestion, so the potential production of uh, biomethane from anaerobic digestion, or uh, the carbon sink, the carbon sequestration effect in soils, or the replacement of peat is a growing media in uh, such cultivations as uh, flowers, trees, nurseries, landscaping, and so on and so forth. So uh, nutrient replacement should not be considered as the only beneficial effect in producing compost. In the end of the story, uh, the primary goal of producing compost is to use organic matter and not, and not to give nutrients back to soils. So the organic matter content of compost should be considered in life cycle analysis. Um, this chart is reporting on the importance of carbon sequestration. Uh, I took the numbers uh, from Italy. Uh, top left, you have got the total production in greenhouse gases, the total emission in greenhouse gases in one year from Italy. Uh, and uh, uh, if you relate it to the potential sequestration of uh, carbon in the arable land area, uh, you come up quite easily with a figure which is the percentage of carbon that once locked up in soils may equal the total emission of greenhouse gases in one year from the nation. So you may see that even the smallest increase in carbon in soils, once we consider the huge arable land area, is an important factor in global strategies to tackle climate change. Um, unfortunately, still carbon sequestration and soil-related effects are hard to be calculated in uh, the emission trading schemes. Most important emission trading scheme worldwide for the moment is the clean de development mechanisms. These are widely adopted in the low-income countries. Uh, the problem is that composting was included in the clean development mechanisms uh, by the CDM board as early as 2005. And the standard calculation method was uh, worked out in order to assess the savings in terms of greenhouse gases. The problem is that, once again, only the savings in terms of methane avoided from landfills are accounted for in the calculation method. So the, still there is no crediting for the soil-related benefits, and this is uh, a, a bias in the total calculation of what might be the best destination for the organics. This is why uh, quite often the CDMs are not funding composting programs, but they are funding some incineration programs, above all in Asia. Uh, much of that is related to the shortcomings and biases in uh, uh, the clean development mechanisms. Uh, let me remark anyway that there is a change in the cultural environment around soils and their role in mitigation of climate change. And one most important study was the Clean Soil Report on Soils and Climate Change, 
which was published by the European Commission in 2009, I excerpted one of the key sentences in the report uh, where, it's, uh, where it reads, the report underlines the need to sequester carbon in soils. The technique is cost competitive and immediately available. It requires no new or unproven technologies. So we uh, may refer back to traditional technologies which are widely adopted in agriculture. And this potential has a mitigation potential which is comparable to that of any other sector of the economy, including industry, transportation, heating, and so on and so forth, in terms of mitigation of greenhouse gases. So even if it is very difficult to uh, calculate the mitigation potential of soil-related effects of using compost, because there are many uncertainties, because they may be soil-related, crop-related, slope-related, weather-related, and so on and so forth. Nevertheless, we know that the magnitude of such effects are, is important, and therefore sectoral policies in uh, the waste policy and in the agri agricultural policy should put at the core uh, the importance of giving organic matter back to soils. So what is the regulatory context for the moment? I will be referring specifically to the current debate in Europe because there is a major turnaround in Europe now in the ongoing debate on circular economy. Uh, there are quite a few uh, political drivers for proper management of bio-waste. One is the Waste Framework Directive, which currently mandates recycling targets as high as 50% by 2020. Article 22 in the Waste Framework Directive specifically refers to bio-waste management, and it says that member states should encourage separate collection if appropriate. We will go back to that in a while. Then there is the Landfill Directive, which I already mentioned, and this stipulates the diversion targets for biodegradable waste away from landfills and also an obligation on pretreatment of anything that is to be landfilled. This is important in that it increases in the mid and long run the cost of landfilling, and so it makes separate collection and composting and recycling more cost competitive than landfilling. Also the climate change program uh, with increasing importance on carbon sequestration, we already mentioned the clean soil reports, and the soil strategy, which considers uh, the importance of organic matter as one of the cornerstones for soil health. But let's focus more narrowly on the uh, current debates on uh, the potential changes in the waste directives in Europe. As already highlighted, for the moment, uh, they mandate 50% uh, a 50% target for recycling by 2020. Uh, there are similar targets here and there across North America. For instance, uh, uh, California recently adopted a 70% recycling target a couple of years ago, I think uh, I remember. And also there is a specific article which mentions the need to encourage separate collection if appropriate. The way the current debate on circular economy is proposing to change such articles is increasing the recycling targets to 65% by 2030, and there is no way to go that far without including comprehensive programs for separate collection of bio-waste. And also Article 22 would be turned from encouraging separate collection if appropriate to Member states shall establish separate collections, so it should become mandatory. Still, there is a discussion on the so-called TEEP condition, which is where technically, environmentally, and economically practicable. This is why there is an increasing focus on practicability of separate collection systems. And this will be the last part of my, of my presentation. We have got wide-ranging and diffused evidence that separate collection systems are viable, are effective, 
are cost competitive and they are accepted everywhere, including the uh, densely populated city centers. It is possible also to implement curbside systems, comprehensive curbside systems, also in large cities. Uh, in North America, it has been done uh, uh, since quite a long time in such cities as uh, Seattle, uh, San Francisco, both of them uh, totaling different hundreds, thousands of people. Seattle, I think I remember, is, around, is roughly around 700,000 people. San Francisco is 850,000 people. In both cities, 100% of the population is already covered by uh, separate collection systems for organics. In Europe, Milan is uh, showing a groundbreaking initiative. It totals a population of 1.4 million people, roughly. Uh, by the way, you know, uh, Milan is the host city to the masterpiece by Leonardo, The Last Supper. And according to allegations, it used to be a separate collection of the organics already at that time. So we are basically renewing a long shot tradition on separate collection of organics, even in the Bible, that was considered to be fair and important. However, <clears throat> there were already some pilots for curbside collection back in 1995. But at that time, that was only covering the so-called large producers of organics, such as restaurants and canteens. And they were already delivering 35,000 tons per year in organics, which were collected separately. A new comprehensive program was rolled out in, uh, uh, to cover 100% of the population, started uh, in November uh, 2012, and then uh, in four shifts uh, it covered 100% of the population, June 2013, December 2013, to cover 100% by June 2014. So you can see uh, it cannot be done overnight, but each shift was covering as many as 350,000 people, and in the end of the story, it doesn't take centuries either. In one and a half years, a, a city totaling a population of roughly 1.4 million people was totally covered with a comprehensive system for separate collection of organics. This was the started kit, including uh, the vented kitchen caddies in order to evaporate the excess water. So this makes the system more clean, more comfortable, more user friendly. And the uh, wheelie beans in order to be the intermediate storage of organics until the next collection day. Then the leaflets, of course, with instructions. There's 600,000 people uh, living in uh, social houses in Milan, but they also do separate collection of organics. Instructions, they had to be turned into, translated into 10 different languages, of course, in order to give comprehensive instructions. What proved to be fundamental was the use of the compostable bags in order to make the system user-friendly, because people feel more comfortable with delivering their food scraps alongside food scraps of uh, the whole building uh, in a watertight compostable bag instead of uh, delivering it loosely uh, uh, in, in the wheelie bin. Um, this is the customer satisfaction analysis, and as you can see, there is a very positive feedback. Uh, in 2013, basically 79% of the people said themselves to be fairly or very satisfied by the system. And this grew to 95% by 2015. Uh, it is important to highlight this one because whenever you roll out such a comprehensive program, uh, there will be a distorting effect of the so-called noisy minority. In fact, those who are satisfied will keep silent, whereas those who have got to face some critical issues, for instance, with the size of the beans or the delivery hours to set out their beans and so on and so forth. They will shout out and they will send the letters to the local media. They will phone the mayor and so on and so forth. But once you run a customer satisfaction analysis, you will find out that always by far the majority they tend to be happy with the new system. And also the cost angle. We have got uh, uh, comprehensive evidence that uh, such systems are cost competitive. 
This is the evidence which is taken from a comprehensive cost analysis that was run by Region Lombardy, the most populated region in, uh, in Italy, totaling a population of 10 million inhabitants, uh, for a total of uh, 1,547 municipalities. Such municipalities were grouped in different groups of uh, uh, municipalities uh, achieving a different level of separate collection from less than 20% up to more than 70%. And as you can see, there is evidence of a reduced cost uh, with an increased separate collection rate. Of course, uh, this requires, first of all, a very good capture of food waste. This is the percentage of food waste in residual waste with such low percentages residual waste will be a material with a very low fermentability, so there may be a very sharp reduction in the frequency for collection runs for residual waste. And this is a big saver in terms of money, but also a very big driver in terms of the increased separate collection also of paper, glass, metals, plastics, and so on and so forth. Also, uh, one of the fundamental issues, and this is the last aspect I would like to share with you, is in many parts of the world, still the cost of landfilling may be uh, very low. Uh, this fundamentally is like shifting the cost to the next generation, because you know that a dump site will turn into a, a need for uh, land reclamation in a few decades. Uh, uh, it will have to be uh, uh, polluted and the cost of land reclamation is one order of magnitude higher than the cost of proper waste management. This is why in many areas of the world uh, they are establishing obligations on pretreatment or uh, the so-called financial liability for the landfill owner for a certain time frame. It has been stipulated 30 years uh, financial liability according to the European Landfill Directive as the obligation on pretreatment, and this makes the cost of landfilling uh, higher and higher. Uh, but let me show uh, the, importance, the importance of this chart. This chart reports on the increase in the cost of life, which is inflation, more or less, in Italy in 10 years, basically it increased by 20-22%. The red line is the increase in the cost of waste management in the same decades. And as you can see, the cost of waste management increased by far more than the cost of life because it not only included uh, the increased cost of wages, energy, machinery, whatever, but also the increased uh, requirements in uh, uh, the management of landfills and other ways of disposal. Uh, the green line was the increase in the cost of waste management in a zero waste district, which was maximizing separate collection, including organics. And it only increased by 8%. So, with an increase in the cost of life and a much higher increase in the cost of waste management, shifting to a new balance with more separate collection, more recycling, more composting, more diversion of organics, puts you in a new steady state condition by which you tend to uh, reduce the increase in costs. Not only you say you will save your money in time, you will also increase the total number of employees, as you can see from this chart, in a uh, province capital such as Treviso, totaling a population of 80,000 people. After a, a comprehensive programs for separate collection, including organics, they went up to 85% separate collection, and they increased the total number of employees from 58 up to 84, so 26 more employees. So not only we are saving money and doing the good for the environment, but also we are shifting the cost of waste management from the cost of capitals and machinery to uh, cost of wages, creating new jobs. And that's the most important. Also, the last uh, notation is the increasing uh, focus on uh, implementation of separate collection of the organics 
in big metropolitan areas. This is a picture I took in New York. I already mentioned the programs in Seattle, in San Francisco, on the West Coast. In New York, uh, Mayor Bill de Blasio declared a Zero Waste uh, 2030 program, and he knows that uh, good management of the organics will certainly be the cornerstone in the program. This young lady is Haley Rogers. She used to be the supervisor of the uh, bio waste management program already in New York. Uh, they started with uh, 200,000 people in Brooklyn, in the so-called brownstones, single uh, family houses with backyards where it is quite easy to perform a separate collection system for the organics. But lately, they moved progressively to Bronx and Manhattan to go biting also the big skyscrapers. And they are already covering some one million people. And you know the lyrics from the song from uh, by uh, Liza Minnelli and Frank Sinatra. If I can do it there, I'd make it anywhere. So if separate collection of the organics is feasible in New York, certainly it is feasible everywhere. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Enzo, for your presentation, definitely organic waste is a key treasure for sustainability and it's great to see all the all the evidence that you put forward and so much cases of success all over the world and especially in Italy that we know has been leading the way for sustainable waste treatment. Um, thank you. If you have any questions, there are a couple of questions I see in the main chat. If you don't mind, we're going to hold this for now and we're going to go to answering questions at the end of the presentation of Kala that is going to be the next speaker. So Kala Rose Sander is a strategic advisor to individuals and organizations committing to stabilizing Earth's climate and she's workers in municipal climate policy for cities of Aspen and San Francisco where she's lead climate action and resilient planning and internal sustainability reporting. She has worked as well for Earth Economics and Rocky Mountain Institute and we have had the pleasure to work with Kala as well for the last years and her advice, her knowledge on the composting and the climate mitigation um, power of composting and the good use of organic waste has been definitely groundbreaking for all of us. The numbers have been definitely enlightening and eye-opening and it's a pleasure and, and a privilege that Kala has been able to join us today for this webinar. So thank you very much Kala for being with us today and I'll just give you the floor right now. Thank you so much. If you are ready, the floor is yours. Yes, we can hear you now. Um, Kala? I just want to say th yeah. hi. Kim, yes. I'm sorry. I'm just having a little bit of my problems with audio. I think it's good now. So I want yes, to say thank it's good. you to Enzo. Okay, good. Um, thank you, Enzo, for your presentation. It was incredibly um and revealing and technically um <laughs> diverse and and intricate and also thanks to marielle for hosting this webinar you all will understand um that i am a little bit perhaps scattered this morning living in america um we are uh looking at a very interesting future as we move forward um but it's my pleasure uh, to be here talking to you all about a solution that I think works for any political cl climate and works um, in any place around the world. So I'm gonna give a very, very simplified presentation and I apologize in advance to all of you um, who are most likely much more technically savvy than this presentation is going to be, um, but I have Lots of resources, if anyone is interested in the details, if they're interested in science study or policy, please uh, write me questions at the end and I can link you up to a lot more details than I'm going to be giving here. What I'm gonna give now is a report on um, a group of people that started a project in Marin. They called it the Marin Carbon Project. Uh, Marin is located just north of San Francisco and um, 
this group of people got together and they asked a question of if their rangeland management could be a solution for climate change. And in asking and answering that question, they actually found out that what was key to the system was carbon and that you could bump the system in a positive direction by adding a stable form of carbon um, uh, in compost. So what we're talking about right now with this discovery is basically utilizing uh, the photosynthetic mechanism of the planet to draw down atmospheric carbon and stabilize the global carbon cycle. Uh, these photos that you see in front of you are taken from a NASA uh, imaging projection of carbon dioxide emissions in the atmosphere. And you can see that the top one, um, about half carbon dioxide emitted from fossil fuels, remains in the atmosphere. And in the winter, it, you can see that it's very present. Um, however, in the summer, when the plants leaf out in the northern altitude and the grasses grow and the trees, the deciduous forests leaf, um, we see a huge reduction in that carbon emissions in the atmosphere. So what we're talking about is essentially utilizing this photosynthetic mechanism to draw down atmospheric carbon. For those of you who are familiar with the Keeling curve, it's that uh, curve that was taken of uh, greenhouse gas parts per million uh, on Mauna Loa in Hawaii, and it kind of goes up and down. There's a little blip on that curve, and that blip is essentially the same thing as this photo is showing. It's the breathing of the earth from the perspective of all of the plants and opening in the summertime and coming down. And what we're talking about is increasing that in-breath every year, driving um, that, that carbon down by increasing the capacity of uh, the soil to hold and store those greenhouse gas emissions. So when we talk about carbon, we're not only talking about carbon, we're also talking about water. Uh, California has been in the midst of a historic drought. Um, this is a slide from 2014, it's now 2016. We are continuing to be in a state of drought. Um, we're seeing a lot of destabilized weather patterns all over the world already. Um, and you know, one of the things that matters to us a lot here and to our farmers is water. Now, the beautiful thing uh, about carbon in the, in the system of our planet is that it's, it's the main cycle on which all the other large elemental cycles are based in one way or another. Water follows carbon. It's an overly simplified statement, but it's true. More carbon in the atmosphere uh, creates what's called atmospheric loading. So more water stays in the atmosphere. This is why part of the reason why we have more intense storms with climate change, because these storms come in and the atmosphere has been able to hold more water longer. And that's because of the presence of carbon in the atmosphere. Similarly, when you add carbon back into the soil, the soil holds more water. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what we saw here in California when it came to that. But this is just to remind you all that water is also a very powerful greenhouse gas emission, as is methane. And so the solution that I'm going to talk to you about today is really uh, solving for carbon and also for water and for methane because these cycles stack on top of each other. So the Marin Carbon Project was um, formed uh, in response to the rapid pace of climate change. They seek to enhance carbon sequestration in rangeland, agriculture, and foil, forest soils through applied research, demonstration, and implementation. We are now scaling this project up to the state of California. In 2017, we'll be announcing the California Carbon Project with partners across the state, including the governor's office, the Department of Food and Agriculture for California, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, which is the United States Department of Food and Agriculture's branch in conservation. Um, farmers, ranchers, nonprofits, food policy organizations, and cities and counties who are engaged in climate action planning. This is just a slide to show you um, the, the, the farmland in Marin that is um, part of the Marin Agricultural Land Trust. And I just brought this up because already in the past two years, we've seen the areas that are in the dark green, 80% um, of those areas have applied to receive funding for compost on their rangeland. So we've had a very high adoption rate. Uh, so what are we talking about here? 
Um, the Marine Carbon Project <clears throat> measured carbon in rangeland soils, and what they found was not that there was a correlation between grazing and carbon, but there was a correlation between past um, <clears throat> application of manure on these rangelands. And what was one of the things that was unique about this project was that the the philanthropists the, who are the ranchers who asked this question to begin with actually brought in very, very <clears throat> high resolution biogeochemistry and science that had never really been applied to rangelands before. So they began looking at isotopic fractionation of carbon in the soils. They took soil samples from 35 sites in Marin. And what they found was really surprising in that there was a huge range of carbon in the soils. And it turned out that the soils that had a high amount of carbon had had manure applied historically. So they took this principle and in order to test this theory that a topical application of an organic amendment on soil would increase soil carbon and water holding capacity, they used compost because compost is a stabilized form of nitrogen, it's a stable form of carbon, it doesn't have the issues with runoff that manure does, it doesn't have the same issues oxidizing nitrogen that manure does. Um, and it doesn't have the pathogen and pest issues that an uncomposted material would have. So they spread a half an inch of compost on their fields, and then the scientists measured what happened. And what's interesting is that in the first six months, they saw no difference between the test and the control plots. And what I'll just add here is that they did a, they did a test of six plots uh, plots of blocks in both Marin and in the Sierra Nevadas. And for those of you who aren't familiar with California, what that means is they bracketed the Mediterranean grassland system, i.e. by looking at it in Marin, they were looking at the wettest part of the system. And by looking at it in the Sierra Nevada foothills, they were looking at the driest part of the system. So in these two climate systems on grasslands, they tested this application of compost. In the first six months, they saw no change on their test plots. But what they did find was that the control plots where no compost was added actually lost carbon. Um, and so even on the best grazed plots, even in the Sierras, even in Marin, it didn't matter. The plots that did not receive compost were all losing carbon. That's a very important piece of information. Later they went and they did a literature review and found that actually grassland soils across the world are losing carbon because of historic management, because of change in weather patterns, because of change in species composition from deep-rooted perennials to short-rooted annuals. But then they found this piece of information that really was a game changer. And essentially what it was, um, was that the organic amendment had increased carbon, net carbon sequestration in the soil by one to three tons. This is an example of the one ton, but we saw up to three tons in some places of carbon in that system. So after six months, the plots that had received a half an inch of compost increased the amount of carbon, not that was just brought into the system. This is net carbon that was brought in and stored. And it was stored in parts of the soil system that hold that carbon longer. So most carbon cycles rapidly through the soils and plants and bodies of animals and microorganisms that live in the soil. But this carbon that they measured, this one to three tons, was held in the more recalcitrant fractions of the soil. So the heavy fraction, the occluded light fraction, these fractions where carbon gets bound up and stabilized and is unavailable for, for respiration or for consumption, and so is good to stay in the soil for 30 to hundreds of years. Well, what did this mean? You know, across the board, we saw also that this compost significantly increased plant and forage production. In fact, um, uh, this, this is two years of data, but we saw this data going out for five years after the one-time application. Forage production continued to be 50 to 70 times greater in the plots that had received compost than the plots that did not, even five years after a one-time application and even in a historic drought. So this information alone is enough for ranchers to be interested in this, not just that it's sequestering carbon, but that it's increasing yields in a time when many ranchers in California are having to sell their herds because they cannot support grazing uh, because of the drought. So just a little bit, um, another slide about uh, the increase in organic matter. 
um, from the compost. And this is a, oh, sorry, I missed one here. And then, um, again, this is just showing that it increased in these more durable fractions of the soil. And if anyone's interested, we have uh, five papers related to this part of the topic, which I can share uh, with Marielle after the conference. This is a simplified version. Essentially, what happened, what we understood is that rangelands are losing carbon, but that with a benefit of compost, these, these lands can uh, enhance their water holding capacity, then increase their forage production. And they also, and this is also very interesting, increase the nutrient availability in the grass. This is a picture of uh, two of, this is a picture of a test site from John Wick and Peggy Rathman's ranch, where it was one of the test locations for this. And you can see those yellow plots are actually plots that had received compost. So the cows, had are sort of naturally selecting these grasses and what they found when they tested the grasses is that the grasses that grew on the plots where compost had been applied had a significantly higher portion of protein and other essential minerals in them so not only was there more grass but the grass that was grown was more nutritious and the cows automatically self-selected for this so with this information um, this group of people uh, took it and, and began to organize what farming and ranching would look like in California uh, and in the United States if you managed for carbon. If you managed for carbon as the keystone in the system instead of for synthetic inputs like nitrogen, phosphorus, if you managed for carbon, how could you manage both for sequestration but for overall health of your system? And they started this thing with the USDA called a Carbon Farm Plan. And for anyone who's interested, you can look up a website. It's called Comet, C-O-M-E-T, Planner. And Comet Planner is a tool that was developed with the Marin Carbon Project and the United States Department of Agriculture to measure the amount of carbon that can come to your soils from different practices. Compost is a very, very, very effective and immediate way to do this, but there are many other ways to enhance carbon in your soils, like restoring stream beds, um, planting hedgerows, uh, cover crops, and not tilling the soil. Um, so in this, they have gone forward. And simultaneously, we have also gone forward in the state of California with understanding how we can produce more compost. Because as Enzo really made clear in his presentation earlier, compost is key to soil health. Um, and we also believe that compost is key because it reconnects the carbon cycle. Instead of breaking that cycle and just moving that carbon into the atmosphere, we are taking the carbon from the, all the organic matter of things that we're living and returning it back into a living life cycle process. So the thing that we've been asking the state of California to do and our partners in cities and counties across the state is to reimagine organic waste as a natural resource not as a single source of renewable energy, because that's a one-time energy resource. We do not believe that a one-time energy resource is renewable. What we're talking about is an energy resource that continues to provide energy and nutrients in the system, and not only does so once, but does so on a compounding factor. The thing that we found about applying compost to the soil was it's not a one-to-one -one proposition. By applying compost to the soil, you produce more organic matter, which produces more feedstocks for compost, which added back into the soil enhances production again and again. Scientists think that we will likely reach a saturation rate where the soil can no longer hold more carbon. But in California and across the world, in, in soils that have below 1% organic matter, um, to get up to 15 or 20 percent where we think that saturation rate might occur would be a great feat. And indeed, Raton Lal from the Rodale Institute thinks that if we were just to get up to 4 percent, we could lower atmospheric carbon. So what do we mean by waste? Well, when we're, what we're talking about here is food waste. We're talking about orchard trimmings. We're talking about manure from dairies. In California, we have a massive historic die-off of our forests. The lodgepole and ponderosa pine in the southern Sierra Nevadas are dying. We have a 90% death rate of our forests in the southern California mountains because of climate change, because of the bark beetle, and because of extended drought. 
So we have a mass amount of carbon that's standing there and we're going to need to do something with it. We also have something that we don't talk a lot about with biosolids and human waste. Um, I really wish I'd put more slides in here for you all that are more sophisticated in terms of the policy. But essentially what we're trying to do is turn this concept of waste into um, compost because this is an incredibly powerful lever for us, not only in the fight to lower carbon dioxide emissions from the atmosphere, but to restore the essential cycles that the planet is built upon. This is my last slide, and I'll just take a couple more minutes to tell you a little bit about California policy because I think the folks on this call are policy people. Uh, we, have a, we have two new pieces of policy in California that are supporting this work. The Healthy Soils Initiative, which is taking money from our Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund that comes from the California cap and trade system and pushing it out towards farms that are engaged in carbon beneficial practices. We also got $100 million to look at um, alternative management of organic waste from manures and from cities, and hopefully a lot of that will be going towards composting. Um, this money, again, is also from the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. So this year in California, for the first time, we saw funds coming directly from uh, a cap-and-trade system to practices that go towards uh, managing organic materials sustainably for compost production and towards soil carbon sequestration. They fall under something that's called the Healthy Soils Initiative in the state of California. And if, for those of you who are interested, uh, you can look that up. Again, the research was from the Marin Carbon Project. There's a sister institution to the Marin Carbon Project called the Carbon Cycle Institute. They do farm policy in California. I work on the compost policy side and we work with partners across the state. Um, I'm going to close it there and open it up for questions. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Kala. Um, it's absolutely inspiring to see the work that you've been doing with the Marine Carbon Project. And I really appreciate that you've been able to join us today um, in such an important political day for the US and for the world. And I just wanted actually to note that Donald Trump is a climate change denier, is someone that said that climate change is a hoax. And today and in the next years, more than ever, it's going to, the work that you have been doing, showing the solutions to climate change, this is, is going to be absolutely critical to make sure that we, that we continue promoting these solutions and that we make them a reality because climate change will happen despite what Donald Trump may be able to understand about it. So we really need to, to be pushing for these solutions. And compost is definitely a key solution for climate mitigation, as, as you have, uh, you and Enzo have both explained, and the results are showing that it's possible. Um, so thank you so much for, for bringing that up in our conversation and, and to, to, to frame a climate conversation um, around solutions, which is something very positive in, in a day like today. Um, so we're going to go for f 10 minutes or so for questions. Um, we have had questions from Luana and Pavel, and Enzo has offered to, to answer. So I'll give you the floor, Enzo. Maybe you can, you can um, address the questions. Sure. Uh, first of all, let me say I was incredibly happy to, to learn from uh, Kala that uh, now there are some, uh, there is some uh, pieces of policy which are directly funding the use of compost onto soils in order to curb greenhouse gases. That's. Um, so the question from, Lu uh, from Luana uh, is about separate collection of bio-based products and materials. I think Luana is referring to such materials uh, as uh, tableware, cutlery, uh, biodegradable cutlery and table, tableware. Uh, first of all, let me make a clear-cut distinction between bio-based and biodegradable, because they are not synonymous. <clears throat> it may be bio-based and it does not biodegrade or the other way around. So this is why I tend to prefer the wording compostable to make it uh, uh, adamantine that we need materials that are deemed to be composted in a normal composting process. 
However, uh, I am supportive on account of uh, more than 20 years experience to the use of compostable bags in order to make the system user friendly, maximize the captures of organics. You have seen the very low percentages of organics and residual waste in many municipalities in Italy, less than 10% organics. Uh, whereas in many other schemes around the world, even after a separate collection of the organics, still there is between 20 and 40% organics and residual waste, which does not make it possible to have a sharp reduction in the frequency of collection rounds. So all that operational mechanism to have cost savings is not practicable if you don't maximize the capture of uh, organics. And in this respect, the use of compostable bags is of uh, utmost importance. But coming to tableware and cutlery, I'm not personally supporting that, and I think that all of us as environmentalists, in principle, we are not supported to uh, one-way cutlery and tableware. So we tend to prioritize reusable tableware and reusable cutlery. But then there are specific situations in which such materials may help uh, sustainable local programs. Let me make a couple of case histories. Um, first of all, there may be some catering services where there is no possibility for washing machines. This is frequently the case with some schools, some small schools, they've only got the catering services taking their meals and having no washing machine on site. In that case, instead of single-use uh, plastic cutlery and tableware, it is better to have compostable cutlery and tableware. So we may collect, the, collect it alongside food waste and send it for composting to a composting site. Also, <clears throat> we had to manage a very big event lately in Milan, which was the Expo 2015. It hosted uh, some 20, 21 million people from uh, around the world. Uh, it was possible in the end of the story to achieve 72% separate collection. And of course, uh, uh, that uh, included uh, a very intensive separate collection program. But when it came uh, uh, to um, tableware, the mandate was to use reusable tableware for all the restaurants and pizza shops where, where there was a service at the table. Then we had the problem with the street food and finger food. With street food and finger food, you can't consider reusable tableware because people will pick it up and go away. So in that case, you need to consider compostable tableware, compostable cutlery, compostable glasses. And so it was possible to collect it alongside food scraps. And this made it possible to achieve the very high recycling rates. But once again, the important is uh, it should not be considered as bio-based, but as compostable. Thanks God we have got a, a standard in Europe, which is EN13432. It was adopted back in 2002, and it is beyond any discussion once a certain material meets that standard, it is compostable in industrial composting sites. Okay? Uh, then there was a, the other question by Powell. Shall I address it uh, that, uh, right away or do you want me to leave the floor oh, to go ahead, yeah. go ahead, Enzo. It's fine. Question. Uh, the behavioral change in high-rise buildings. Well, uh, to refer to the situation in Milan, in Milan there, is, there are 40 waste inspectors. They go touring around the city uh, and they may put stickers, red stickers, and refuse collection if the material is not compliant with the, uh, the quality which is required. So normally this is the carrot, and the carrot takes place during the first months after rolling out the separate collection uh, system. Then comes the stick. Uh, and so we have got the, the fines um, at a later stage. However, what's most important is the good operational design of the system. 
First of all, you need some kitchen caddies in order to have a good quality and to prevent uh, the uh, delivery of large items such as uh, bottles, flasks, along, alongside uh, food scraps. Uh, then, uh, the most important is to have a higher collection frequency for food scraps than for residual waste and for packaging waste. Uh, by doing that, uh, you will push more people to deliver their food waste separately. So you will have a clear distinction between uh, fermentables, which will be collected more frequently, uh, and uh, on the other side, residual waste and packaging waste, which will be collected less frequently. So it is the operational context and the operational design that creates the good behavior. However, to sum it up with a, with a figure, uh, in Milan, we are running some composition analysis on food scraps on a regular basis, and typically we have around 4% contraries, which makes it suitable for good composting at most industrial composting sites. In the smaller municipalities around Milan, quite frequently we are around 1% and less contraries inside uh, food waste. So it's fully in line with uh, uh, high quality composting. Great, thank you Enzo. Um, yeah, thank you for this comprehensive answer. Um, we had another question about the uh, savings of water um, through the practice of composting, which you also answer, Enzo. But I was wondering if Kala may want to give us a little bit more insight into the local policies in California that are making a reference to the benefits of composting for um, for the to respond to the draw and and so on. Kala? Yeah, sure. Um... So right now, the benefits of composting in California are getting awarded through uh, a carbon recognition only. However, because of the implications of water, um, increasing water holding capacity in the soils uh, are so enormous. We are working with the United States Geological Survey in the state to understand what we could do from um, a water holding capacity perspective and essentially by covering, by um, treating our rangelands with compost, this is a theoretical scenario. Of course, you could never treat all of the rangelands with compost in California. We don't have enough compost and you can't get to them. But theoretically, by treating them with the response we saw, we could have our rangelands hold as much water as could currently held by the Sierra Nevada snowpack. So it's a very, very, very large implication for water um, in our landscapes. And I think it's so important to understand that the way we've largely been approaching climate change and environmental policy in general is very not part of the circular economy. It's very like, how do we save it? How do we not use it? Um, how do we apportion it out to different places? But what we're talking about here with the way we understand how carbon works now in the soils, we're talking about restoring whole functions. So it's not just water savings that you get from composting. Um, you do get water savings. Uh, a lot of orchards and vineyards use compost for this reason already. Um, but you get restoration of the hydrological cycle. Um, it, we found in the Western United States so recently there was a, a metadata analysis done and they found that soils that held more water in dry climates were more likely to trigger precipitation events either in the form of full rain or in moisture um, attraction from fog and other sorts of low forming clouds, clouds. So essentially what that's saying is that in soils that can hold more water, more water is attracted back into the system. So as you add carbon back, you get more water. And as you add get more water, you get more water. So there's a, a stabilization of the hydrological cycle that occurs when you begin to stabilize the carbon cycle. So I'll just, I'll, I'll leave it there. None of our policies are specifically addressing water savings yet, although I think that they will in the next two to three years. That's amazing. That's really, it's really good to have this 
holistic vision um, and approach to climate change and to and to seeing that composting can tick so many boxes at the same time that's totally inspiring um, I want to um, yeah put attention in this question of Penelope she he mentioned um, I wonder Kala if you can um, address these whether you've done an application if you compare the application of compost with an equivalent nutrient value on synthetic fertilizers yes that's a great question and yes we have we did a life cycle analysis of um, compost manure and synthetic fertilizers uh, with um, University of California Berkeley uh, Dr. Marcia Delange and Dr. Wendy Silver and I can share the paper with you um, but essentially, uh, both manure and uh, synthetic fertilizers are positive from a greenhouse gas perspective. They produce more emissions in the process, whereas compost application uh, is a net negative, and that's from diverting uh, organic materials from landfill or slurry ponds or burning and towards compost and then applying that compost on the land and the resulting carbon sequestration. Um, from a nutrient value perspective, compost works a little bit differently than synthetic fertilizers, which contain water-soluble nitrogen. Compost is nitrogen. There's a little bit of it that's water-soluble, but most of it is bound up um, with the carbon, and so it becomes available as needed. Uh, it's more like a slow-release fertilizer. Um, there are some crops that really need a high, high nitrogen content, and in that case, you might have to add more, but a lot of crops do really well with compost and it really reduces. That's the other thing about compost that's so wonderful is that not only are you getting it out of landfill and getting it on the land where it's sequestering carbon, if you're not plowing that landscape and you're replacing synthetic fertilizers with compost, you're also getting rid of that whole incredibly toxic and highly um, greenhouse gas intensive process of synthetic fertilizer manufacturing and placement. And just to go back to the water issue, in California, 69% or 71% of the, of the fertilizer that's applied to our croplands, the nitrogen ends up in our water table. So we are over applying nitrogen and that nitrogen when it's applied also releases nitrous oxide, which is a powerful greenhouse gas emission. Whereas if you were to replace that with compost, which is using nutrients from already available feedstocks on the landscape, not manufacturing them and getting it down there, you would greatly reduce both atmospheric pollution and water contamination. So the paper is available. If you're interested, I'm happy to share it with you. You can look up Dr. Marcia Delange. She now works with the Union of Concerned Scientists and she has a blog uh, and she's got a great blog to follow if you're interested in agriculture and climate change. Excellent. Yeah, if we can if we can share this paper with us, we can also um, send it to attendees to the webinar. Thank you very much. Um, great. So there's been a bit more of conversation in the chat. Uh, finally, there's been even exchange of emails. So I'm very happy that the conversation after this webinar may be continuing. Um, maybe just as a final round of reflections, I wanted to pose a question for the two speakers on whether what if you could give us your insight on what do you think is the main challenge and the main opportunity that we are facing right now and you can apply this to any the context that you are working in whether that's Europe or US or California as to how we can make the best use of organic waste and and applying all these all these solutions that you've been talking about what's the main challenge that you think we are facing right now and the main opportunity as well to to make that a reality and to move forward with this with this with our agenda um any ladies of you come first that? No place to leave. Ladies, come first. Well, Enzo, I want you to come to California and help the California Air Resources Board because it's developing its methodology right now for accounting for land sequestration and um, emissions from uh, organic waste management. So you can come and help. I'll be us. happy to help even from the I'd be happy yeah, to help. We'll, <laughs> we'll yeah, talk sure. about that. Um, I think two challenges that I see, one is most immediate is 
the perceived competition from uh, energy production and, and the need to kind of get rid of waste as quick as possible. So I see that often incineration is an option that's offered either for biogas or biomethane production. Um, we have a lot of money going towards digesters and um, other forms of paralysis. I see that that is a big competition for compost um, and I, it's one of the biggest challenges we face most immediately here in California, not for large incinerators for energy, but um, really for burning in our ag sector. And it's just, it's such a shame because it's missing the bigger picture. You know, it's taking that um, material out of the cycle and putting it into the atmosphere where we really don't need it. So I think our, our short term challenge is going to be to create accounting frameworks and other incentives that really um, work in a positive ongoing manner and that account for long-term benefits. And we don't have accounting right now, even in life cycle analysis, that accounts for ongoing benefits in the system. So I think that's a really big challenge from a policy perspective. I think from a, from a philosophical perspective, people's fear of death and dealing with things that are wasted or dead or done is really challenging because we tend to not want to look at it. We tend to want to flush it away or burn it or get rid of it as soon as possible. And I think understanding how death is part of an integral cycle of life, not from a religious perspective, but actually from a physical, biological perspective and how we manage that process of death is a challenge for us, um, I think, society. And then in terms of hopeful bright spots, um, the University of California, along with Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, is about to publish a paper that's going to show that it's not going to take a lot to lower carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from these types of practices like compost application on rangeland. We don't need all of agriculture to do it. We just need a certain percentage to do it. And it's not as big as you think it's going to be. And it's totally possible to lower Earth's atmospheric temperature via managing for carbon in the agricultural cycle and compost plays such a central role in that. So I have a lot of hope that it's technically possible for us to stabilize our climate now. It's just a matter of getting the policies and practices in place to do so. Thank you for that positive thinking. Excellent. Um, Enzo, do you want to add to that? Yeah. Um... Well, first of all, we know the economics of uh, the management of organics uh, have different angles in different parts of the world. Uh, while we I was working in Cambodia, uh, most of the cost of the composting process was covered and not by the waste taxation because there was no taxation at all and they were only having some dump sites in the countryside. But uh, uh, it was the value of compost that was covering uh, the cost of uh, processing organics into compost. And in that respect, what's most important is also the slow release nature of nitrogen. Uh, when I was working in the European Climate Change Program, the sub subgroup on soils, this is something important to share also with Kala. Uh, one of the cornerstones of the life cycle analysis were, was that we were considering an increased production of nitrous oxide, which is a very powerful greenhouse gas, after using compost. And I was asking them, why are you considering an increased production of, of uh, nitrous oxide? Because they said, well, you will have more nitrogen in soils. I was saying, well, look, when we teach farmers to use compost, we tell them, don't use the mineral fertilizers anymore. So you will have the same amount of nitrogen, but it will be nitrogen in the soils ready to be turned into nitrous oxide. So uh, it was important and still will be increasingly important in the low-income countries to have such aspects focused also in the emission trading schemes because they are becoming the main driver for the implementation of in, uh, comprehensive waste management strategies. In the Western world, uh, what's uh, becoming the main driver is the need to divert away from landfills. And this is making landfills more and more expensive. Of course, there is an increasing pressure to divert more towards incineration. But we, have we had plenty of arguments today 
to show evidence that the best is to give organic matter, organic matter back to soils instead of feeding incinerators. And uh, this is on life cycle basis, but also on operational basis on the evidence of practicability and cost competitivity of separate collection systems. So always keep it in mind. Excellent. Excellent. That's great. Um, so thank you very much. I think we can wrap it up here. Um, it's been a, a joy to hear you both talking and, and providing all these expertise, insights, arguments and evidence on the case for a sustainable use of organic waste and an application in composting as a solution to climate change and, and the, the systems of the, ec the whole ecosystem. So um, this webinar once again, it's going to be recorded, so this remains as a resource to all people interested working in policy um, communities or NGOs or practitioners in the field. So we'll share it with you. Make sure that um, you share it um, to everyone that can be benefit from this. So. Thank you so much for the attendees. Uh, don't hesitate to send us your questions, comments, and see you soon in next webinars or other activities that, that we may organize that can be of your interest. Um, I'm going to leave it here now. So thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye.